Hey everybody, this is Mikey D. Welcome to my stoop. A long time ago, in a far off corner of a big city, was a small American town called East Harlem. There were a lot of faces, but no Facebook. Some twits, but no Twitter. And we didn't use a device to socialize. We opened the door and walked out to our stoop. It seems like such an ancient time, like it was a lost city. Almost as if I had watched it all from the stoops of Atlantis. Episode 8 The Whacking of Mr. M Not for nothing, but I knew Mr. M was a rat the first time I saw him. He came uninvited to our home on 118 in the summer of 71. I had just turned six. The Beatles had only broken up a year ago. Yeah, that's right, the freaking Beatles were still a thing just last Christmas. Vietnam was still raging. And there were rats everywhere. Rats are now welcome in most places, but in East Harlem was the biggest badge of dishonor one could wear. Especially in the 70s. Yeah, this student god's Mr. M was a rat. He came, he squatted, he ate our food without even asking, he'd walk around with nothing but his old fur coat in front of us kids. He scared my mother and she was no wuss. But one look at that big nose, beady eyes and fat freaking body sent shivers down my tough Italian mother's spine. Not for nothing, my sisters were no fans of him either. He wasn't a relative, he wasn't a friend of mine, he wasn't a friend of ours, not an associate. Where he came from, I don't know. He was a mystery wrapped in a ravioli. Maybe he was on the lamb. We never did find out, but my dad came to the same conclusion we all did. He was bad news. Mr. M had to be whacked. Hey, did I tell you he was a rat? Well, you got clams in your ears. He was. Roaches and mice were something you dealt with. Until some genius invented combats and my mother agreed to get a cat, they were a problem. You killed them, sprayed them, and hoped they didn't walk up the wall when company was over. You tried to stay one step ahead of the six- and four-legged SOBs. Rats, on the other hand, were an event. You had a rat. They were the uninvited guests. And a rat is not a mouse the same way a tornado is not a breeze. Arsenio Hall did a bit comparing rats and mice. He was right on the money. A mouse will timidly tiptoe around the perimeter, apologizing all the way. A rat will march across the room, grab the remote from your hand, and ask for a friggin' beer. Mr. M was more devious. He was the Stephen King of rats. Little hints of his presence, shadows, soft scrapings of his claws on the linoleum. He was building tension, putting us on edge, using rat psychology. Then, and only then, would he make an appearance and scare my poor mother to the heights of horror. Mr. M was not only a rat, but also a manipulator, and he was getting into my head, whispering in my ear. Being a devilish six-year-old, my twisted and sometimes sadistic nature saw the opportunity for some innocent jesting. Mr. M and my father's shoes were close in size, close in color. Go ahead, Mikey, it's fun to scare. Let's be allies, the rat would say his voice echoing in wet whispers from some undisclosed location. So like a dummy, I was influenced. I would hide behind a doorway and hold a shoe firmly to the floor and wait. My mother would eventually step out. That was my cue. A strong push, and the shoe would slide across the floor, a brown blur, a scream, then a yell. There was a distinct difference between a mother's scream and yell. A scream meant she was scared. A yell meant you were dead. One became the other in a New York minute. After my dumb joke, I would laugh and run into my room to hide. Eventually, when the yelling stopped, I would hear her chuckle. And to this day, she still finds humor in it, although she'll still slap my arm when we talk about it. Mr. M hung around for weeks. Why should he leave? He was well fed. He had us all under his hairy and non-opposable thumb. And he was turning me into his associate of horror. 
My memory for the nostalgic detail is good, but there are a few instances I may need to take a little poetic license with. After scaring my mother three or four times, my father put an end to that. No more shoes, Megalooch. I had to tell Mr. M the scam was over. No more shoe thing. Mr. M was annoyed. He said I was being the rat, losing my loyalty. I told him my loyalty was for my family, my crew, and not some rat for who knows whereville. We needed a sit down. Yeah, Mr. M, me, and my dog Gypsy. Yeah, Mr. M, he was concerned for his safety. He was scared Gypsy would bite his head off. So he said an associate was coming for his protection, some pigeon named Machiavelli. It took place at 4 a.m. on the dark end of 118 near the Washburn factory. At 4 a.m., the street was desolate, dusty place like a movie. Gypsy's claws were echoing on the cobblestones. She walked ahead of me. My steps were muffled by my feety pajamas. Yeah, I wore feety pajamas. You got a problem with that? I'm pretty sure I saw Booby Cooey standing on the corner with a Chinese dwarf in a Napoleon hat. They were admiring some park Studebaker that belonged to Danny Dunn. We stood there alone, like two Jadrews, and at first we thought we were stood up. Or maybe there was more like we were set up. We better get back, Gypsy said. She was as loyal as they come. But then I see this bird. It wasn't a pigeon. It was a parrot. A big green parrot. Waddling down the cobblestones like some freaking T-Rex wannabe. Who are you? I asked. I'm talking for Mr. N. He's feeling a little skiffoey. Worried that dog is going to whack him. He's behind the Chevy. You think I'll go to where Gypsy give him a mats here? Get out of here. He has an offer, the bird said. We was waiting. The parrot looked at me, tilted his green head. He wants maybe you still do the shoot thing, but maybe just once, twice a week. And the traps, how's about popping them so we can eat the cheese and not worry his nose is going to get snapped off? I can't do that. My dad will kill me. He's the boss. So how's about you put some cheese next to the trap? Maybe you throw one of your shoes instead of the old man's. I looked at Gypsy and she shook her muzzle no. I can't do that. He's got to give me something, Mr. M said from behind the car. It's only right. Hey, you moved into our territory without asking, Gypsy barked. You owe me. I know people. I could cause problems for you, Mr. M said. No, no shoes, no food. I owe you forgot on toast. You're gonna regret this, Mikey D. Mr. M stepped out from the Chevy's front tire and he waved to the parrot. Let's go. Gypsy laughed and barked. Yeah, go get your shine box. Hey, Polly, I said. How about you? Want a cracker? Here, here's a firecracker. I took a pack of firecrackers from my pocket with it. And with the fuse sizzling, I threw it at them. Twenty wild pops echoed down the street. Mr. M took off and the parrot flew high over the avenue. Me and Gypsy thought about getting some of our beats. Well, maybe it was a dream because I opened my eyes and I was in bed. The sit down, wherever it took place, had accomplished nothing. So I decided to try to get back into my mother's good graces by putting my imagination to a more constructive use. No more shoes. I would have to help whack Mr. M. I must confess no one paved the road to my door with my new twist on the mousetrap, but my super magnetic rat trap did work, sort of. I was always making things as a kid, a mad inventor. A mini version of the mad scientist with a beetle's haircut. I had the materials needed to neutralize Mr. M. Some sticks from a tinker toy, a number of logs from a Lincoln log set, some rubber bands, and most importantly, a large U-shaped magnet. After scouting the apartment for the best location to construct my Rube Goldberg contraption, I settled on the open area under the kitchen sink. From what I recall, the magnet acted as the main support for the food-holding part of the trap, as well as the conk-on-the-head device, like a coyote hunting a roadrunner with an anvil. I placed a piece of Sunny Doodle as bait, took one last gawk at my handiwork, I was impressed at my engineering and theoretical knowledge of rodent massacring technique. Then I went to bed. The next morning I awoke as usual, but there was an almost audible buzz in my stomach, like Christmas morning. But it couldn't be. I could feel the heat of the summer morning sun coming through the window of my small, narrow bedroom. Why did I feel excited? Was there a picnic planned? A trip to Palisades Amusement Park? No, the trap. I got up, raced in toward the kitchen but I stopped on my tracks at the door. There might be a bloody mess under the sink. Rat brains and sunny doodle crumbs. Nasty. I peeked around the doorframe. 
No brains. No blood. But wait, the magnet was on the floor. A bite was taken from the yellow cupcake. It worked. Well, sort of. There was no rat in sight. Mr. M's body was not there. But wait, maybe my father had already disposed of it. No, Mike, he bemoaned. But your invention worked. Give it another try. My father always encouraged my imagination, no matter how out there it was. I pouted, but I managed to smile. Rats. I might be remembering this wrong, but I think there was a note, scribbled in rodent droppings, on the wall under the sink that said something to the effect of, Nice try, punk. Just watch your back the next time you reach for a Twinkie. It was signed, Mr. M. So bigger guns were needed in a territorial battle against Mr. M. It was out of my hands. My father decided it was rat season, and his hand-pumped pellet gun would be taken from its dusty box in the top of his closet, cleaned and prepped. Somebody was getting whacked. My dad positioned himself on the sofa where he'd have a clear, unpeated shot at the doorway between the living room and the kitchen. We had a front-loading washing machine, and he attached a square piece of plywood over the round glass window to protect it from the hail of lead that would rain down on Mr. M. The Sunny Doodle had proven itself the perfect temptation, so my dad placed one on the old marble doorway saddle, put on the honeymooners as me, my sisters, and my mother went to bed. What happened between Jackie Gleason's moon face flashing on our black and white TV and the rising of the sun is still a mystery and subject of great debate. The fact is this. When morning arrived, there was a large bite taken from the cupcake. No rounds were fired. Only snoring had ricocheted through our East Harlem apartment that night. I never said anything, but I distinctly recall another note, scratched with rat claws on the wooden plank that protected the washing machine. It said, Yeah, nice shot, Clint. The ugly truth seemed quite apparent. My father, after working all day and battling traffic on the LIE, had the audacity to fall asleep whilst on guard against Mr. M that night. Foiled again. In the end, a few days later, our family won out. The body of Mr. M was lifted into an empty sunny doodle box and laid to rest in the garbage can before our building. Little poison pellets, hidden in the cake, had finally done the trick. I believed I heard a muffled declaration of Mr. M bounding in my dream world that night. O oh, true apothecary, thy drugs are quick. Thus, with a kiss, I die. That night, as my mother slept at ease for the first time in weeks, I heard the sound of a garbage can cover falling to the ground. I peeked out the window, down to the front gate. It was a quiet and cold early September night. The shadowy figure of Mr. M, partially lit by the yellow streetlight, trotted confidently towards Pleasant. I am pretty sure he turned my way and flashed me the bird. Well, old rats never die. They just wander off into the shadows of legend, like the stoops of Atlantis. This has been the Stoops of Atlantis with Mikey D. Stay tuned for future tales and bizarreness from that ancient land called East Harlem. Check me out on Facebook. <laughs>